All right, cool kids, welcome back to Dr. Sonny's Super Happy Fun Anatomy Hour. This is lecture 9-3 on the autonomics. Uh, so in this lecture, we're gonna be talking more in depth about the autonomic nervous system, its regulation, whatnot. We've mentioned briefly in the past uh, the uh, sympathetic nervous system in relation to the IML in the thoracic spinal cord. Uh, we've mentioned the parasympathetics in the uh, cranial nerves, in the uh, brainstem, but there's lots of things we still don't know about how the autonomic nervous system uh, acts and receives its information. So that's what we'll talk about this time. Of course, the autonomic nervous system regulates the four Fs of life, fight, flight, food, and reproduction. Uh, and uh, so the sympathetic, of course, is responsible for that fight or flight response, whereas the parasympathetic is responsible for the uh, rest and digest uh, responses uh, that, that our body naturally undergoes. Uh, so we all understand that, but let's take a look at how this uh, system is regulated. When we mentioned the parasympathetic uh, vagus nerve, the cranial nerve, uh, what we noticed was that a lot of these GVA fibers uh, and the SVAs synapse in the nucleus tractus solitarius. So this NTS, uh, when we look at its connectivity, actually uh, serves as a central component of the regulation of the autonomics. So you have the sensory afferents of the autonomics uh, synapsing in nucleus uh, solitarius. Uh, the uh, NTS is then sending that information to various other regions of the brain, including other brainstem nuclei, uh, to uh, regulate uh, automated responses, as well as to limbic areas <clears throat> and to regulate emotion, as well as the hypothalamic nuclei in the hypothalamus, which will then regulate our hormone response uh, to the disposition of our bodies and the things that are going on in our body. So in this way, that autonomic response, those sensory afferents, uh, go to NTS, and NTS regulates, uh, connects that output uh, that will eventually occur. So it's a very simple chain, uh, just like all neural chains, but uh, some are longer uh, and some are shorter. So this one's a, a fairly direct uh, automatic response, whereas things like volitional control involve a number of different uh, 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 neural chains through the association cortices uh, to regulate that uh, volitional response that we have. <clears throat> so we understand about the somatic uh, efferents. So the somatic efferents from the anterior horn exit out through the anterior rootlets to form the uh, spinal nerves, which then take a peripheral fiber to innervate whatever skeletal muscle is involved. The autonomic efferents <clears throat> travel out of the IML within the thoracic uh, spinal cord. Travel through the anterior rootlets, uh, just the, their efferents, so they're traveling there. Then, after joining the spinal nerve, they very quickly branch off in what's called a white ramus. The white ramus is so named because these preganglionic neurons are ensheathed. Uh, so they have that uh, uh, ensheathing around them, which makes them a white matter tract, if you can think of it that way. So that's why it's a white ramus. So that uh, that fiber enters the white ramus and joins up with a uh, sympathetic chain ganglia. That, that uh, fiber can ascend or descend a few levels or it can synapse at that level. And that uh, level is where the uh, postganglionic cell uh, body is located. That postganglionic cell uh, body then has its axon going through what's called the gray ramus, uh, gray ramus communicans is the full name. And uh, that is a gray ramus because these postganglionic fibers do not have Schwann cells ensheathing them. So uh, uh, they are, as you know, a slow fiber. Uh, and so uh, that's why that is called the gray ramus communicans. And then that fiber, it travels out along the other nerves uh, of the body uh, to eventually meet up with some arteries traveling along an arterial plexus to thus synapse on a target ganglion. Uh, 
So that's the typical case. There are also um, some exceptions. There are uh, preganglionic uh, uh, fibers that travel through nerves called splanchnic nerves. And these travel to, there's, a, there's three of them, a greater, lesser, and least splanchnic nerve in the thoracic cavity. And so these splanchnic nerves uh, synapse on what are called collateral ganglia, uh, which are located uh, near the organ uh, that they'll innervate, um, usually a, along an arterial bifurcation at the location of an arterial bifurcation. So that's... Uh, that's the comparison between the somatic and the autonomic. Now let's add in the parasympathetics down here on the bottom. We can see those parasympathetics uh, in the uh, cranial nerves. Here we have vagus nerve. Uh, that parasympathetic efferent is going to uh, travel down the vagus nerve which travels along the GI tract, the esophagus to the stomach, et cetera, et cetera, uh, until it meets the intramural organ, uh, ganglion, in the wall of the organ that it is innervating, that that fiber is responsible for innervating. So in so doing, uh, <clears throat> that intramural ganglion is named because it is within the wall of the organ. Uh, so uh, pretty easy there. Um, we have some of these parasympathetics in the head that we've already talked about, the ciliary, the otic, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so now we're talking about these uh, intramural ganglia within the uh, thorax abdomen region. So this slide's just trying to further compare uh, these different uh, structures uh, between the somatic and the autonomic. Not too big a deal there. Don't take this slide too seriously. It's just a little overview, but uh, we'll move right on. So what do these autonomic sensory fibers detect? Well, they detect chemoreceptors. There are mechanoreceptors to detect pressure, changes in pressure in an arterial wall, like the carotid sinus. Uh, and there's also a visceral nociception. So we get a sense of pain from our organs when there's inflammation or things like that. Uh, so here we can see, let's talk about the afferents now. So those were the efferents. Now let's talk about the afferent processes. So here we have uh, cranial nerve parasympathetic afferents. So these are GVA modality. And these GVAs, um, in this case, we're talking about um, the uh, vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve in this picture. But there are GVAs um, that I didn't tell you about in facial. Uh, basically, if there are GVAs in a nerve, it's going to have, or GVEs in a nerve, it's going to have GVAs as well. Um, but the GVAs in facial are uh, inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. So here we see uh, in uh, red uh, coloration on this map, we have the GVAs. We can see that here's the carotid sinus with the peripheral processes of these GVAs coming from the inferior ganglion of glossopharyngeal, and those processes travel uh, centrally to the uh, NTS and synapse on the NTS. So we're getting carotid body um, pressure information going to the uh, nucleus tractus solitarius. So damage to glossopharyngeal nerve uh, and, and this fiber path will uh, cause a dysregulation of blood pressure. We also have autonomics from the aortic arch that are detecting similar things going along vagus nerve. We also have autonomics detecting uh, pain in the stomach, nociception, uh, mechanoreceptors in the stomach going to NTS as well. So there's an example of some of these parasympathetic afferents in cranial nerves. But there are parasympathetic afferents not just in the brainstem but also in the sacrum. So, the, yeah, the hand pointing down, that was great for sacrum. Uh, so, these sacral uh, afferent parasympathetics, there are parasympathetics in two places, the brainstem and the sacral spinal cord. Uh, because, if you'll recall, vagus nerve only innervates down to the, uh, the left colic flexure, the splenic flexure of the colon. The descending colon and the pelvic uh, organs, the pelvic viscera, are all innervated 
by sacral parasympathetic. So the afferents go to the sacral spinal cord as well. So we see here that although these red afferent fibers are getting the, the GVA sensory information through the spinal nerve, and although the GVA cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion, these things do something interesting. These fibers go retrogradely uh, back to the anterior rootlets before uh, synapsing finally on uh, substantia gelatinosa, uh, uh, nucleus tractus solitarius, those sorts of uh, nuclei within the uh, spinal cord, the sacral spinal cord. So they do something a little bit interesting. <clears throat> so what do the afferent sympathetics look like? They look very similar, uh, and, except that they are, these GVAs are traveling through the posterior uh, the posterior rootlets. Uh, so you can see there uh, these visceral nociceptors from the sympathetics. Uh, okay, so we noticed in these last few slides that these uh, GVA sensory things, they are synapsing on uh, dorsal gray matter. So the dorsal gray matter is responsible for the dermatomes of the body. There are no internal dermatomes. So that means these uh, autonomic GVAs synapse on neurons that represent sensation of the skin. So for that reason, when they, you get a sense of pain in a visceral organ, then that sense of pain is consciously mapped to your skin, your dermatome. So we can see here that... Um, uh, the uh, damage to like uh, pain in your diaphragm uh, or your heart is going to map to the left side of the C345 dermatomes. Uh, so diaphragm there, C345, the heart is getting uh, uh, thoracic sympathetic afferents from a little bit lower down into like um, C8. Uh, so we can see that's why the, uh, the heart is mapping lower along the arm. Uh, so you can take a look at this. This is the concept of referred pain. So visceral pain is referred to the sensory dermatome uh, of the skin. So there are, uh, we've talked about here now, the autonomics, the um, parasympathetic and sympathetic. But in addition to those, there is another autonomic system that's not often discussed, and that is the enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system, as its name suggests, is uh, completely uh, encased around the wall of the GI tract, and it independently regulates the digestive systems of the, uh, of the GI tract, the intestines and the colon. Uh, and what's interesting about this is that uh, these neurons can, um, uh, they can operate independently of, uh, independently of the uh, cranial parasympathetics, the thoracic sympathetics, or the sacral parasympathetics. So this system can be completely disconnected. Now, much like the heart, it's regulated by sympathetics and parasympathetics, uh, but if those are disconnected, it will... Uh, peristalsis and other functions will occur naturally. Uh, to do this, there are a great number of neurons in the enteric nervous system on the wall of the GI tract. Uh, some estimates range up to as many as five times as many neurons in the enteric nervous system as there are total in the spinal cord, five times. Uh, so it's said that uh, the enteric nervous system is about two-thirds the size of a cat's brain. So about the size of a dog's brain, because we all know dogs are not as smart as cats. Don't worry, don't worry. I don't like dogs either. I equal opportunity hate here. I just dislike them for different reasons. But uh, there are, are a vast number of functions. So you have a dog inside your belly churning your stomach for you, a dog's brain, basically. I, I'm just joking. I don't know if the dog and the cat have different sized brains. Uh, so, at any rate, uh, it's, it's, it's just an interesting thing that we need to understand along with the, the uh, sympathetics.
and parasympathetics. So here in this diagram, it looks complex, but it's really very simple. So we see here that the thoracic uh, spinal cord contains the lower motor neuron of the sympathetics, the IML, that's this black region. We can see there are the sympathetic chain gang ganglion, also called paravertebral ganglion. <clears throat> so these, um, these sympathetic chain ganglia are the location of the uh, postganglionic sympathetic efferents. Except for the splanchnic nerves, we see the greater, lesser, and least uh, splanchnic ganglia here with their nerves traveling directly out to them. So that's what we've got there. Um, so the, um, we can see on the other side of this diagram the parasympathetics isolated to the brainstem and the sacrum. And the sacrum is doing the descending colon uh, and the pelvic organs. <clears throat> uh, what else do we have? So uh, you can see that each of these ganglia send, send postganglionic fibers to different structures. And um, I am not going to test you on specific uh, levels for the sympathetics, um, but there's one uh, thing, one clinical correlate that's common enough that you need to understand, and that's called Horner's syndrome. Uh, so Horner's syndrome is caused by damage to the superior cervical ganglion in the neck. Superior cervical ganglion, as you can see, goes up here and supplies um, the uh, sympathetics of the eye, including the uh, uh, levator, the uh, superior tarsal portion of the levator palpebrae superioris. Uh, it's going to uh, supply uh, the sympathetics of the face for uh, capillary dilation. It's going to supply um, uh, portions of potentially the thymus, uh, as well as uh, some of these glands in the face. So Horner's syndrome, damage to superior cervical ganglion and the sympathetic supply to the face will result in unilateral ptosis of the eyelid, meaning a drooping of the eyelid. Uh, it will result in a flush of the face as well as um, uh, 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 meiosis of the eye uh, because of the sympathetics to the, uh, the eye uh, structures, the smooth muscles of the eye. So that's an important syndrome to understand because damage to the superior cervical ganglion can occur uh, quite readily uh, just behind the uh, carotid sheath. Uh, and then, so here I'm now highlighting those uh, collateral ganglia. I got an animation on the silly slide. Um, one, okay, so one thing to note here is that the adrenal gland doesn't have a postganglionic fiber. It is directly innervated by preganglionic fibers. So that's another little exception to these rules. <clears throat> uh, and then, so this uh, slide just has a list of uh, comparative functions between the sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation. And it's about what you'd expect. Um, so you've got the eye here going down to the skin, the gut, uh, and then to the pelvic organs. Uh, so um, one of the little mnemonics to remember uh, the, um, the functions of the creative organs is that parasympathetics are responsible for pointing and sympathetics are responsible for shooting. So that's the little mnemonic, if that helps. <clears throat> so anyway, moving on. So here we have uh, showing you, and I'm sure you've seen this before, the neurotransmitters associated with the uh, sympathetics up top and the parasympathetics below. So most of these are acetylcholine, except for the postganglionic sympathetics. That's the only exception, and that's norepinephrine. What's interesting now is that when I was in graduate school, we uh, operated under the belief that one, uh, each neuron uh, only produces one type of neurotransmitter. But now we know that there are multiple cotransmitters packaged with uh, neurotransmitters by neurons. And so along with the release of, for instance, norepinephrine, you also get release of these cotransmitters in different amounts uh, 
uh, which can have a multitude of different functions because they're going to bind to different receptors. So the story is uh, getting ever more complicated about how the central nervous system and the uh, uh, autonomic nervous system operate. Uh, so what do we have here? Um, so here on this slide, again, it's just comparing the neurotransmitters and what they're synapsing on, what neurotransmitters released into these different uh, synapses. So here we have sympathetics releasing acetylcholine. Uh, here we have, uh, or parasympathetics down here in the sacral, we have parasympathetics from the cranial, from the brainstem, uh, releasing acetylcholine. Here is an example of uh, some sympathetics releasing norepi uh, onto certain um, uh, structures, certain um, uh, smooth muscle uh, structures. Whereas the glands over here, we're seeing that the, the glands are getting uh, acetylcholine from the sympathetic nervous system. Um, not very important, but just note that uh, we have here the uh, divergence that occurs in the sympathetic uh, nervous system. So one neuron has collaterals to a lot of other postganglionic cell bodies, whereas in the parasympathetic that doesn't occur, that's uh, generally one-to-one. -one. So you get much finer control over parasympathetic functions than sympathetic functions. And that makes sense because when you need a flighter, fight or flight response, you want it right away and you want it full power, boom, go, you know, but uh, parasympathetic, sometimes you want to digest to varying degrees, and so you activate uh, one or more uh, uh, postganglionic neurons for that reason. Another interesting thing about these is that the uh, synapses are different, is that one axon can span across multiple uh, smooth muscle cells and have little uh, boutons, varicosities, uh, all, that span multiple uh, smooth muscle cells. So imagine there's little swellings in each one of these fingers, and each one of those swellings is a connection to a separate smooth muscle cell. And so the synapses look very different uh, in this arrangement because the neuron doesn't have just this one distinct target. It has these swellings that uh, uh, encompass uh, a uh, multiple smooth muscle cells. So that's it for this lecture. Uh, we'll go into part two after this.